all the content that we have today. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, really excited to spend a couple of hours uh, this afternoon talking about DAOs. Um, before we get into the four awesome panels that we have today, I um, wanted to walk through a couple of things, set the context for uh, what DAOs are and sort of how, how they fit into the broader ecosystem of things happening in crypto. Um, but first, I'm Clay. I'm a principal at Slow Ventures and we'll be playing both the, uh, the opening act and, and MC today. Um, Slow is a, a generalist fund um, that is investing in early stage companies across a, a broad swath of sectors. Um, but I spend my days focusing on early stage crypto and, and crypto adjacent things. So um, in just a second, uh, we're going to welcome the, the four panels that we have today, but want to, again, take a few minutes to set the context for, for why we're here and um, what, in my opinion, is, is exciting about DAOs. So uh, defining sort of what DAOs are, they're actually pretty simple in the abstract. Um, they're just a series of smart contracts that define two basic functions, who owns what, and how decisions are made. Um, and we'll get in today's panels and a bit uh, later in, in this deck um, into the complexity of uh, where DAOs kind of get messed up and, and, and the current problems that they face. Um, but in my opinion, what's most interesting about DAOs is the fact that um, they're a platform for really endless experimentation in the ways in which individuals and capital can combine towards productive outcomes. And if those two key elements around um, decision-making and, and ownership uh, sound familiar, it's because uh, it's, it's really what defines DAO's real world analogs, which is organizations. Um, and so, uh, you know, even in the early innings of the DAO ecosystem, as it's been emerging, um, we're starting to see the creation of digital organizations that look like companies, uh, firms, investment funds, co-ops, committees, uh, nonprofits, and, and really uh, any type of organization that needs two key functions, a, a bank account and a way to coordinate. Um, but the difference between these real world uh, analogs and, and DAOs is that um, in many ways, the speed and efficiency that these things can come together um, is seemingly instant, especially on a relative basis when compared to uh, their, their real world analogs. And so to put DAOs in the context of secular trends, um, I posit that, that they're following um, the, the decades long progression of digitization where uh, things like the internet digitize information for the first time. Crypto as we speak is, is digitizing money in earnest. Um, I think DAOs are really creating um, digital organizations for the first time. Uh, and, and while you know, these are a platform for experimentation, <laughs> these experiments are actually quite large. Um, so DAOs today, just these simple smart contracts defining these couple of uh, key elements uh, are overseeing and managing around $8 billion in capital uh, and are seeing hundreds of millions of dollars in on-chain revenue generated. And so um, the, the scale at which these things have grown just over the last few years in, in you know, uh, their, their adoption, membership and, and control over a, a massive amount of, of capital and, and putting it to interesting use uh, is uh, still quite large, even, even in its real, relative nascency. And so, you know, tons of money, uh, people loosely organized, small groups, uh, fallible humans, what, what could go wrong? And I think that's where uh, DAO, the complexity for DAOs comes in is humans were, were inherently fallible and like the well-defined structure of the contracts underlying DAOs. And as with most things in crypto, the, the likelihood for a hackathon project or a group chat amongst friends with a few contracts uh, can come become sort of the, the preeminent leader uh, in its category is actually pretty high. And so with this increased consequence comes a need for a focus on the care and, and coordination uh, of its members uh, so that things like the assets underlying the DAO, the culture and, and the productivity don't erode. And I think it's this problem of, of coordination that I anticipate will be covered a lot through, throughout the panels today. And so, um, as I mentioned, we've got a great lineup today and I selfishly put this together so that I get to ask some of the, the burning questions that I have about various aspects of DAOs uh, and the DAO ecosystem from some of my favorite people that are uh, building in it, investing in it and supporting it. And so hopefully for folks that are new to DAOs, this will give you uh, a sample of the different aspects uh, of the ecosystem for those building and operating around the ecosystem, a great snapshot of the current state of the world. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to move to our first panel. Um, we want to talk about um, DAOs and 
the relative state of, of decentralization, which I, I think falls on a spectrum. Um, and so I'm excited to have two folks from uh, DAOs that are building on sort of either side of that spectrum. And uh, Theo, who's from Xerox Labs, which is an exchange protocol uh, facilitating uh, the permissionless exchange of any crypto asset anywhere in the world uh, and helps lead the work uh, towards Xerox's eventual progression towards uh, full on-chain governance um, where all aspects of the DAO uh, will control uh, the, the future of the protocol. And Ash, uh, from Cha Tracer DAO, which is a perpetual swaps protocol uh, and, and market creation protocol. And um, what's interesting and, and why I wanted to have him here is, is they've started as uh, a DAO from day one and operating in, in more or less a fully decentralized fashion. And so um, maybe to kick things off. Oh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Ash is in Australia joining us at, at I think, 3 a.m. his time. So really appreciate you taking the time uh, so so late in the evening and, you know, shows your uh, your passion for, for what's being built here. So um, maybe to kick things off, uh, and we can start with either one of you, but it'd be awesome to sort of define the genesis of uh, the Xerox and Tracer DAOs and, and their current function today. Um, maybe, uh, Ash, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Clay. Um, no, really keen and excited to, to be involved uh, with the slow team here as, as well. Um, it's, yeah, it was an interesting one. It was at the start of uh, this year. Um, there was a group of us uh, that were working under the banner Mycelium, um, a software development company doing a fair bit of work in the derivative space. So we started off, um, you know, uh, heavily involved in the chain link um, space uh, in, in sort of 2018 and then evolved on from there and sort of watched uh, the synthetics Aave um, evolution I suppose, um, spurring on DeFi compound um, up there as well, um, sort of at the start of 2020. And we, we started to sort of develop and, and, and build, um, you know, solutions for, for a couple of these um, products, synthetics namely, um, and saw how these DAOs were, you know, being structured and, and, and sort of running from the ground up. And it was the early, early sort of 2021 period where we, we had started to, to build um, some of these financial products out, ourselves. Um, we started you know, in an open open source manner, and um, we shoot it. You know, we shot our uh, our um, you know GitHub through to a fair few people, and it started to get spread. And um, it quickly became something that we were we were really keen to pursue. And um, it got got picked up by a few a few members, um, you know, in our network, and and you know quickly a DAO um, sort of emerged. <laughs> on chain uh, and we decided to get involved after there was you know about there was about 150 people um, you know claim initial TCR um, in this in this DAO structure um, and and then a proposal was put forward for mycelium to get involved to to, to build um, out what would be this suite of derivative products that we've we've got now so it's um, a little unorthodox but it was certainly DAO first uh, at the beginning of the year yeah, I think that's just so interesting how this sort of organic coalescence of, of uh, individuals within a community uh, combined with just uh, token ownership uh, it has, has defined not only the DAO, um, but also this third party entity in, in things like Lion's Mane, uh, which is sort of the third party organization that's, that's building and contributing um, code to, to progress the, the protocol. And, uh, work in earnest to get distribution. So, so that's awesome. Um, and we can talk more about different aspects of that in, in a minute. But uh, Theo, you want to cover um, sort of the other side and, and how uh, ZeroX has progressed? Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, on our side, it's, it's very amazing to, to, to watch how these uh, DAOs are arising now and the models that they are basically following. Uh, 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 with regards to ZeroX, if you want, it, it went through the process that is more traditional uh, by basically you know doing a, a token sale to 2017 and pretty much um, giving a team the mission of okay with this token sale we're going to bootstrap the open protocol pretty much we're going to create the first version of the protocol knowing that there's there's need some that there is a need for some level of centralization and and uh, accountability to build this protocol and, and to make it grow now fast forward uh, to the future of where basically the the, the final destination is, um, the protocol is governed by ZRX holders, and all voting is happening in on-chain binding governance systems. Now, in between, we are today, 
And uh, what it, well, the things that we've done are um, uh, mostly around two, um, two areas in how the protocol is upgradable. So it used to be upgradable only in monolithic fashion, meaning like similarly to how, for example, Uniswap uh, versions are, are happening, uh, you pretty much need to deploy the contract and call it, this is the newest version of the, of the protocol and all the ecosystem needs to move towards that. Whereas in uh, Xerox v4, we launched a system by which we can upgrade it at a functional level. So pretty much the entry point of the protocol doesn't change. And now suddenly the protocol is upgradable on feature level that eventually are gonna be voted with on-chain binding systems. So that's really on the technical side. And uh, the idea again is to, in a future, uh, this protocol is built by any team that has vested interest in, in the protocol. On the treasury side, which is something that we launched this year, uh, we have went from day one on with a non-chain binding uh, system, similar to what is done by Uniswap and, and, and Compound, for example, where basically the treasury of the Xerox DAO uh, is fully owned by the ZRX holders, and there's no intervention by any central team, so to speak. And actually, as of today, actually, there's a non-chain governance system going on right now, closing in one hour, and it's uh, the second one that we're running on the treasury, and it's pretty amazing to see. So yeah, the, the progressive decentralization is in, in motion for us too. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting, the approach that ZRX has taken in so far as um, starting with this core centralized company uh, uh, that, that's contributing and shepherding the open source protocol um, and is progressively moving towards this world of abstracting themselves from uh, from th that that decision making process and handing the keys over to to the masses, which um, I think will have some interesting sort of knock on effects. Um, but I, you know, as we're seeing with this first experiment where you've deployed, uh, I think it's about four million dollars into a community owned treasury and seeing how uh, the, the individual token holders come, come together to decision how those funds should be allocated is, is a fantastic experiment. And um, yeah, uh, I'm sure that there'll be some, some great learnings as well too, but, but those guardrails that are in place uh, inherently make it a, 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 a rigid structure, but, but one that um, allows for at least a bit more care to be taken in, in the context of, of its progression um, and, and both have trade-offs. So um, I guess getting back to Tracer, Ash, can you talk a little bit about um, the structure of the DAO and, and how decisions are made today um, and sort of what are the types of decisions uh, that, that have been made so far in, in its early history? Yeah, sure. Um, it's interesting, I suppose, um, as a part of like Mycelium, which as you alluded to, uh, as Lion's Mane, we've rebranded to Mycelium, but um, it's interesting. Like we, as a part of our service agreement to the Tracer DAO, um, specified that we wouldn't vote for, for 12 months on, on any sort of proposal as we would have had a majority stake stakeholdership of, of that, um, you know, voting structure. So, um, you know, at the moment there are the, those initial 150 claimants plus now another 150 um, that have been sort of accepted through the DAO um, via an application process. So it's about 300 different, um, you know, DCR holders that, that are able to vote on these um, on these different proposals, and at the moment we've we've seen um, you know things uh, like an academic partnership um, you know be formed with the university here in Australia, for instance, and that's been passed through on chain. Um, we paid for our first audit. Um, you know what we're saying, um, plenty would argue, but uh, paid for our first audit using using the Tracer DAO directly with Sigma Prime, um, an auditing company based here in Sydney working on a on an F2 client. So um, you know that that interaction, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, like businesses um, interacting with DAOs. And I think um, just recently Gauntlet uh, you know established their first, I, I believe it was with Aave, but established their first reoccurring um, revenue based uh, you know contract with a DAO um, as a business, as a C Corp. So that's really interesting. Um, and I think, yeah, we'll see a little bit more of that. An, an interesting proposal that um, flipped uh, in terms of the voter weight um, a few times that, that got passed just recently was, was one with um, this pseudonym Yamashita um, that came on as an advisor. So if you check out the discourse, um, discourse.tracer.finance, you'll be able to read through that proposal and, and, and follow through the snapshot and, and, and see um, you know, how it was voted on. But 
it, you know, long story short, it was an advisor that wasn't willing to disclose their, um, you know, their personal information. And so it was interesting to see how in the discord, in the discourse, there was a lot of back and forth, like we're having to vouch for this entity um, because, you know, we know, we know who it is, for instance, um, but the rest of you know, this public environment that doesn't. And to see how they sort of dealt with that was very interesting. Um, but yeah, I suppose I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, and, and it, it brings up a good point that I'm sure will be discussed a lot today, which is um, sort of this, the elements of privacy that exist within DAOs today. Um, parts of it are fully transparent, right? The treasury, um, the decision-making processes and the like, but the individuals that comprise DAOs um, uh, really can, can kind of start to become the, the truest definition of a meritocracy where you abstract your identity completely and anything that you contribute or what you contribute determines sort of your worth to the DAO, um, but also does introduce some complexity insofar as you don't know who the counterparty is. And, and so that um, uh, obviously has has some, some trade-offs. Um, but maybe just following up on, on one point, you know, you talked about uh, representation and, and, and the, the structure. Um, how, how does Tracer today interact with the real world? Because I know you guys have done some thinking around, you know, DAOs, uh, you know, don't have a leader or an entity, at least in, in some form to, to hold accountable as a counterparty. So um, yeah, what, what does that look like today for you guys? And what are some of the early experiments that you're seeing happen there? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I think there's like a few key things that DAOs can do. Um, and, you know, there's obviously the, the governance, the infrastructure layer, so the actual protocol that the DAO is governing on chain, like, like Theo um, alluded to with the zero X um, system, being able to upgrade um, this, this protocol on a function specific layer. Um, and then, you know, you have the interface layer. So that's where it gets a little bit blurry, like um, the Uniswap Labs case with, with the Uniswap um, interface, um, there's a clear ownership piece there. Um, by a C Corp or, you know, an organization, um, you know, and then you have the community engagement development cycle, um, you know, there, there's the other sort of touch point, the meet space where it touches with, with you know, C Corps, individual contractors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I suppose like at the interface layer, we can, we can address that one. Um, I think we'll see trends um, towards you know, an IPFS-based deployment um, that, that certainly, um, you know, from a user perspective on the web, will we'll decentralize the, the, the ownership of that, um, you know, that interface being a trustless interface. Um, but that's only sort of one piece of the, of the, of the puzzle, I, I feel, um, at the infrastructure layer, um, you know, in this, you know, uh, in sort of um, decentralizing it, it's it's in our opinion very important that 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 cannot be um, sort of tampered with uh, in any meaningful way. Similar to the Uniswap style um, launch um, of, of their versioning um, of the contracts, um, for obvious reasons, I think uh, it's it's like um, you know a Linux uh, the Linux operating system. Most of the world's computers build on top of. Um, you know, a Linux operating system, you want something that is, that is unstoppable at that layer. Um, and then, you know, from a, from a, you know, market interface layer, like um, plugging this, this infrastructure um, into, you know, different systems that, that have a real, you know, um, con you know uh, connection to the meat space, like an exchange, like a, like a centralized exchange, you know, registered, um, you know, license holding entities. Um, I think that's where it gets really, really interesting. Um, yeah. and, you know, on, on that, you know, from that perspective, you'll see, you'll start to see a lot more um, yeah. uh, recognition for, for these DAO entities, like the work that Baron Wright's doing with, with Open Law, rebranded to Tribute DAO. Um, you'll start to see the legal identity of these things um, be recognized and wrapped such that they can interface directly with a, um, you know, a centralized exchange to begin with, but, you know, in, in the future, brokerage firms, interactive, interactive brokerage firms, et cetera, that exist in the market space, um, you know, from that perspective. So coming into this environment. So I think that, yeah, we'll see some really interesting um, trends there. Yeah, it's, it's the, just this kind of generalized trend towards comfort with counterparty risk, right? In, in decentralized finance today, um, we have you know institutions and entities and, and regulators that need to get comfortable with this concept of smart contract counterparty risk. 
uh, in in you know them being uh, these these uh, smart contracts being sort of the shepherd of funds and and the code that that is law in terms of how those funds are are managed and and uh, and, and moved. Um, and with DAOs, it's it's again a series of smart contracts that are the counterparty uh, and the entity that that individuals that are contracting with or engaging with uh, have to get comfortable with that as as the counterparty. Um, so it's a it's a just a new model for for adoption. Um, Theo, uh, talking about sort of like how these things sustain themselves moving forward, um, be curious, you know, as as Xerox progresses from um, this token fundraise as as sort of the initial funding vehicle through to creating a DAO that's self-sustaining, what's sort of the model that that you guys are thinking about in terms of, of ensuring that, um, you know, uh, in, in perpetuity, this this uh, entity can exist and, and sustain itself? I think, uh... Yeah, the, the primary objective is to create value at the end of the day. And uh, we, Xerox is in a business like many of the DeFi protocols of pretty much connecting supply and demand of different types of uh, maybe uh, supply and demands. However, uh, yeah, and this marketplace uh, type of equilibrium creates value for both, both parties. Obviously the most uh, concrete way of uh, um, making the DAO governing the settlement system of such marketplace self-sustainable self is extracting a portion of the value being created. So obviously this can take forms of the classic fees on specific type of transactions, for example. We have experimented that at zero X uh, as, as perhaps some of you know, around specific markets on open order book by extracting a protocol fee that is then redistributed to the, to the to the, some stakeholders of, of the of the ecosystem. However, that was embedded in a way that um, was pretty uh, opinionated on what these stakeholders receiving the, the redistribution of the fees were. We are currently rethinking the model, also you know, like uh, acknowledging that the open order book model for zero X is, is not the prominent one. Uh, there are other markets that are working much better now that are creating much more value for users and, and uh, liquidity providers. Uh, including AMMs. And I think that, yeah, the, frankly, right now, we are not really too uh, worried about value extraction. Uh, the Most of the value, including the one used and present in, in treasury, uh, should be used to grow this pie. Um, I know that we are doing different things than the traditional corporation world, but in a way, every startup that's getting funding from VCs uh, worries about value extraction at the very end and uh, uses all the funds to make sure that the uh, yeah the, the, the marketplace is, is growing as much as possible and I think that's that's a sim we should be looking at uh, in a similar way for for the entire Xerox ecosystem and it's definitely something that we're thinking about in Xerox labs company as well but yeah definitely uh, right now I'm very excited to see how the treasury of which is of uh, 10 million dollars by the way because of also we got the contribution from Polygon. Right. Um, we, yeah, right. We, we want to see that uh, put in, into motion. We want to see positive ROI. And uh, once that is transformed in something positive in, in the growth of the ecosystem, I think uh, yeah, the opportunities for value extraction, maintaining the value creation bigger than the extraction, that is the most immediate way of basically having a self-sustained now. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Um, well, we've got just about a minute left here. Uh, maybe 30 seconds each. And Ash, I'll start with you. Um, what sort of does the future hold for uh, Tracer in, 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 in the next year or so? And, and how, are, how would you like to see things progress as, as, as we get down the line here? So, so yeah, look, we're looking to build risk, risk management infrastructure at the end of the day. Um, this, is, this is what derivatives were created for um, in their first case. And we're going to look to extend that vision forward in this DeFi environment. I think a lot of um, this, this space is about getting high leverage. Um, you know, that's all well and good, but then there is the real case for, for market creation and, and this Cambrian explosion of you know, plugging in data sources, um, spot market infrastructure, and then being able to tra trade derivative markets, whether they're through a perpetual swap contract or a perpetual pool contract that you know, we've, we've engineered as a new primitive um, and we'll be launching in the next month. So, 
you know, from that perspective, it's to, to build and continue to build a suite of products that, that offer value um, in, this, in this function, this risk management function to users, um, you know, in the open world of finance that we're all going to see in the next year. You know, year. Awesome. Awesome. Thea? Yeah. For us, I'm going to give an answer for the ecosystem and one for DAO. For uh, the ecosystem, I think in, in our liquidity uh, supply and demand equilibrium, I think we're very much demand constrained at this point, meaning liquidity is good uh, on DeFi. Uh, there's a lot of total value locked. There are great professional market makers. What we need to grow is the demand side, getting millions of users into def DeFi, definitely something that I'm looking forward to, to, to doing all together. Uh, for the DAO, um, yeah, I hope to see in the next year uh, a few wins under the DAO's belt. Um, yeah, basically you, utilizing in a productive way these funds to really, uh, the most immediate way of doing it is grants, but really seeing like teams that were uh, awarded grants basically being successful with those and starting to creating benchmarks around positive ROI of, of, uh, of treasuries, basically. That, yeah, you know, those are the two things. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think that's a, a good place to stop and, and we'll move on to the next uh, panel. Ash uh, and, and Theo, thanks so much. Ash, I don't know how you could string together sentences at 3 a.m. I'm not sure that I could, but hopefully you go and, and get some rest. And um, yeah, really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to, to chat today. And um, yeah, talk to you guys soon. Awesome. Thanks, Clay. Thank really appreciate it. See ya. See ya. Great. So as our next panel gets set up, um, we're going to be moving on to a panel that I call, I'm calling DAO's IRL. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, I think it should be called more something like DAO's in the trenches. But um, anyway, uh, the, the four folks that we have joining um, are um, from across the DAO ecosystem. Uh, we have uh, Julia, um, who's the co-founder of Orca, which is a protocol that is solving uh, the coordination decision-making problem that, that I've been harping on in, in the first uh, couple uh, minutes here uh, and, and has been a contributor across the entire DAO ecosystem. Brian uh, is a co-founder of Rabbit Hole, um, which is enabling users to fall down uh, uh, the proverbial rabbit hole of uh, uh, various uh, protocols and, and also um, is doing some work to help build reputations online uh, and on-chain for, for users and, and participants within DAOs. Um, Larry is the co-founder of, of Reverie and, and a, a protocol politician uh, working to, to actually do the work to help DAOs progress in various forms and fashions. And uh, finally, we have Kevin, who's co-founder of Boardroom, um, which enables easy uh, accessibility and management of member participation in DAOs. So, um, Thank you all for, for taking the time and um, excited for, for what we're going to run through here. But um, maybe to set the stage in context, um, uh, and, and anyone can take this, um, it'd be great to walk through sort of a few examples of DAOs and how they fall on the spectrum of um, what I sort of outlined in the initial slides of sort of serious and requiring a high degree of operational integrity versus um, more loosely organized yet still productive entities and, and how you guys think about the taxonomy there. Yeah, I can awesome. I can dive in real quick. I think I think yeah. we're seeing um, you know we're seeing a huge uh, proliferation of different use cases, right? For for DAOs emerge, and um, obviously different use cases are going to require different structures and different governance processes. Um, and for you know a lot of community focused use cases that we've been seeing, um, where you know the most of the decision making or consensus revolves around off chain uh, decision making mechanisms, um, communications via existing Web two tools. Um, a lot of the governance systems that are set in place don't necessarily require high security measures or high, uh, high degree of um, on-chain execution. So we're seeing, um, for example, a lot of uh, community-oriented DAOs, curator DAOs, project-based DAOs, or, or even service guilds um, emerge with uh, more of off-chain consensus mechanisms. So quick ways to make decisions, come to some sort of like formal, formal decision, uh, formal consensus, and then move on. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, though, we're seeing, uh, you know, the DeFi blue chip protocols um, with billions of dollars locked in, in treasury, et cetera, rely a bit more on the formal on-chain mechanisms, more secure mechanisms making decisions that also involve a lesser degree of frequency, right, in, in how they make this. So um, there's a 
massive range of spectrums. And, you know, when we refer to DAOs and, and call them decentralized autonomous orgs, every single word in that, you know, in that acronym can es essentially evolve across a, a different spectrum of use cases and, and processes. So um, it's amazing to see this, uh, you know, explosion uh, in, in diversity and use case, but um, we have to be aware that the, the governance processes themselves they're utilizing are very, very different um, when it comes to security, uh, frequency, and, and decision-making capabilities. Yeah, that's a great primer, Larry, Brian, Julie, anything to add there? Yeah, I would, um, I would agree with pretty much everything Kevin has said, and maybe add uh, a little, um, a little of my experience here uh, on top, but, you know, I, I sort of think there's, you know, DAOs are a little bit like companies, right, where at a very abstract level, we just have groups of people working together, right, and building cool stuff. And, um, you know, sometimes just like you have, you know, some company cultures, there is, um, you know, there's a very kind of high quality bar for some corporate cultures and basically everyone has you know dedicated you know a, a portion of their life to building the, their idea into existence right and then there's companies that are a bit more loose right and lax and there's less uh rigidity um within the culture and i think DAOs are basically that you know there's there's cultures where uh you go in you work on this little thing with very little supervision you get paid for it and everyone sort of you know gives you a hurrah and then there's cultures where it's a little bit more top down, frankly, but, um, you know, as a result of, of that sort of coordination, um, there's uh, more strategy involved, more high level planning for the roadmap, sequencing on the product launches and, um, and a higher sort of quality bar for all those products. And, and that's not to say one is better than the other. It's just to say that there's all sorts of different company cultures and they all work. And similarly, I think there's all sorts of DAO cultures that work really well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, you, you look at um, uh, previous analogs of like uh, when certain companies with clashing cultures have, have been acquired, right? And, and that lack of meshing actually leads to a, a destruction of productivity and, and, and the speed at which companies uh, can progress and innovate. So no, I think that's a, a good point there. Um, and, and so um, I guess one more thing I, I like to, you know, especially with, with uh, these novel concepts and, and the audience, it, it'd be good to do one more sort of definition question, which is around um, the various roles that folks play within DAOs. Um, because, you know, given that there isn't this hierarchical structure of, of you know, um, uh, CEO all the way through down to um, folks in the mail room, you know, what are the different roles that, that people play within DAOs and, and um, how has that progressed in, in the early innings here? Yeah, I can uh, jump in here. Um, so probably you want to organize this into like two types of DAOs first. There's obviously like the higher level DAOs that Larry was talking about, which is like Uniswap, the compounds of the world. And then there's sort of like the lower level like community DAOs. And those are things like Index, you know, like a rabbit hole or C Club in some cases, right? I think each of those two have different roles like in itself. Um, I think the the higher level DAOs have much more of a similar role structure as companies. And I think as you go more towards the community level DAOs, I think those roles get a little bit more flexible and a little bit more, uh, a little more granular in some cases. Like for example, like in the in the community oriented DAOs, there are things like scribes or like NFT artists, right? But the company level orgs probably will have just normal org structures in some cases. Um, I think this is a lot of where the, the pod structure comes in as well. So maybe maybe Julia has some thoughts here. Yeah, I was gonna say I feel like a lot of this is still being defined. Um, and figuring out like what roles are even available. Um, like I know Larry is working on this right now and trying to even put together a job board of like where do jobs or opportunities even exist in a DAO and it's really difficult to identify that right now um, just because we have like we sort of identified in you know the different levels of DAOs like we have these very more centralized team where you're like a full-time member of a project and then there's these really loose, more com community contributor roles. Um, but even finding the opportunity to like seed yourself in ecosystems is really difficult right now, um, which is where we sort of see like interesting use cases happen with a pod model and basically having these like open seats on um, working groups that are, you know, tasked with a specific responsibility within a project ecosystem. 
So it's very clear like where there's kind of opportunity for contributions um, to be made and start to define that a little bit more clearly. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, Julia, you're, uh, the, the process through which decisions are made in DAOs is something that we haven't necessarily talked about today, but I think is important in the context of what you're building with, with pods is in that um, today, in, in most cases, DAOs make uh, decisions based on consensus rule across the entire ecosystem. So everything from how should we allocate you know, $5 million worth of our native token down to should we hire this person uh, are, are all uh, require participation from across the entire DAO membership, whereas um, the, the structure that you're working to implement um, breaks it down into sort of atoms and bits or, or smaller pods, as, as you like to call them. And so um, I think that that, that uh, uh, you know, simplicity in terms of, of enabling delegation of decision making um, is, is important in the context of the progression of, of these organizations. So um, that's that's uh, fantastic. And so um, I guess getting to some of the core um, pain points within DAOs today, um, one that, that I've seen come up a, a fair bit and would be great to get folks across the, the panel's thought here, thoughts here is um, uh, the problem with attention in, in terms of um, there's all of these various types of DAOs that you can engage with. And, and if you're, you know, especially technically talented or um, uh, have have experience in um, governance proposals or, or things like that, you you have the opportunity to, you know, participate within 10, 15, 20, 20 different DAOs. Um, how are, do you guys each think about that problem and, and where do things start to coalesce and, and what are some sol uh, solutions that, that need to be enabled to help to solve that, that yeah, attention issue? I, I can take this one. Um, so a big problem we see at Rabbit all the time is that a lot of individuals want to participate across multiple networks at once, but the problem is they need context to actually get involved, right? And there's this metric that some DAOs think about, which is called like time to contribution in some cases, which is how fast can they have context to actually go and contribute, participate in a network or a community. Um, and a lot of what we think about is like how we start focusing attention to specific networks and DAOs, they can start contributing right away in, in some context. A lot of people who contribute to DAOs don't wanna be part of one DAO, they wanna be part of multi multiple DAOs in the same context that like creators want to be part of like multiple platforms to actually have a stream of income, right? Um, and so if we kind of think of like Dunbar's number in terms of how many DAOs can someone actually participate in at, at a singular time, um, I think it's once we start defining what those roles are that we kind of talked about, then we can start saying, hey, this person's a curator, this person's a treasury manager, these seven DAOs need help they can participate in all seven DAOs at a singular time, instead of like joining a verticalized group of say like treasury managers and like contributing towards that collective as a group. I think that as, as, as DAOs kind of become standardized over time, I think that will become much easier to contribute across the groups. And that's when things like on-chain reputation become much more important because then you can start saying things like, hey, this person is a really, is like an expert in treasury management, they could be used you know, in, in this network, instead of having to go through like a traditional application process and then being, you know, um, part of a larger group to contribute. So um, I think aggregators um, in general can really help with the attention problem and are really focused on curating the relevant information um, to get uh, individual participating in that network and contributing. Yeah, I think you teed that up for well for for Kevin uh, in terms of, you know, uh, aggregation of information. What are what are some of the trends that you're seeing in terms of um, that that number of DAOs that, that folks uh, uh, within boardrooms ecosystem are, are engaging with and, and the relevant information that actually drives that engagement that these organizations need to, to progress. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Brian hit, hit the nail on the head right there. It's, it's really about bringing context, right, to all these potential participants. The more context you can provide to them in the least amount of time, the more involved they can become in, in a short period of time. Um, and not to sound too pessimistic, though, but just like highlighting how early we are in all of this, right? Like, most decisions and most DAOs are still made like unilaterally by a small number of stakeholders, right? I think it's still a small driving force, but we're trying to like involve as many different, like as, much, as many diverse stakeholders as we can in every decision um, and delegate, you know, I think the uh, responsibility um, to, to, uh, to very, very fo highly focused like uh, members of the DAOs as well. Um, but I think what we're seeing today is this like massive split between super, super high, and just from, you know, just looking at participation data, um, super highly engaged uh, members of DAOs that contribute across 10, 20 DAOs, um, what we're calling the delegates to protocol politicians, right? Like super highly, highly defined roles. Um, and then the more passive long tail 
um, of folks that are maybe voting passively here and there in one DAO or another, like might be incentivized to do so if there's a contentious uh, proposal. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, when it comes to like participation, all that stuff, we're seeing, still seeing like sub 10% participation for most DAOs, right? Um, and yeah, the big question that's not not only for DAOs, but for any governance system, right, and, and, and uh, around the world, um, is how do you increase that engagement number? Um, and I think we're, right now we're so early that we just need to start with core inf access to information, right? We can focus on participation and engagement and, and you know, expanding the, uh, the roles that these members have in the future. But right now it's, it is really just like helping these people onboard and understand what they can actually do to contribute to a DAO, what it is the DAO actually is there for and to do um, and how they can be aligned you know, with that when it comes to the decision-making. Um, so obviously boredom as an aggregator, we're really focused on just you know, indexing a lot of this data, standardizing how you know, the UX feels to these DAO participants and then providing the tools to lower some of those, those frictions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think step one is really just lowering the barrier to entry by standardizing and creating accessible information um, about like what the DAO is doing to contextualize the decisions in the first place. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Larry, I was hoping you could talk a bit about sort of how you uh, and, and folks uh, within Reverie and, and, and across the DAO ecosystem are participating today. Because I mean, I think that um, the development of, of code and, and, and deployment of code, I think are are one bucket that's pretty clear in terms of the progression and maturation and upgradability of, of these organizations. But I think the other key piece is, is governance um, and, and, um, and actually thinking through uh, uh, different proposals and, and what needs to be uh, implemented to, to continue to progress the, the organization as well. So could you talk a bit about um, your work and, and, and how um, that's actually instantiated in the context of DAOs? Yeah, for sure. You know, as um as folks have mentioned, it's it's really difficult to, uh, you know, let's say you really just want to contribute to a DAO. It's really difficult to understand the historical context of the DAO, who, you know, within the DAO has the social capital, right? Because again, we're dealing with groups of people. Some have more, um, uh, you know, respect within that community and some have less, right? And so if you want to do anything significant, you obviously need to think that stuff through. And you know, developing that context, understanding, okay, if this DAO, let's say, is a DeFi project, right, and it has a product, what sort of um, features or growth tactics or you know, acquisitions even would we want to do to improve the product, improve usage, um, grow market share, right? Understanding all of that takes a lot of time, requires a lot of work, understanding the market, understanding people. Um, and then writing up a proposal, right? And actually executing on all of that work. And so, you know, the, what we do at Reverie is, is really think through, um, you know, very, for, for any particular project, what would generate long-term value for it, right? Whether it's a product or a new department, right? Or pod or, or committee, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then actually implementing it. So it's if it sounds a little bit like a, a hands-on sort of private equity approach, that really is what it is. Um, but it's it's difficult, and we, we you know we would love to see more people doing that sort of stuff. But developing that context, uh, it, it takes time. And I think actually it's a really good idea for DAOs to create you know onboarding guides basically so that people have this context, understanding the strategy for the DAO, the long-term strategy, right? Let's say the 10-year you know, plan is, you know, um, launch these products and get this market share within these verticals, right? Um, and then working backwards to understand what needs to be done to achieve those goals, right? That sort of context setting, just like companies have to do it. I think DAOs have to do it too. And, you know, we try to do that the best we can, but it's, it's been difficult. Yeah, no, as, as with anything coordination related across, across the ecosystem. Um, so uh, kind of getting back to pain points, what are, uh, and, and anyone can take this if, if there's a specific talk track that you're, you're passionate about here, but what are other pain points that you see within the ecosystem or, or within sort of DAOs as, as they organize and function that uh, need to be solved today? Yeah, I think a big one is talent allocation. Um, so a, a lot of these DAOs have pseudonymous members um, and don't have a, a true identity. They're basically relying on Twitter in most cases to sort of like build up their resume cases by just posting about, uh, you know, things things that they're um, 
uh, things they've expertise on or, or things that they voted on is sort of like using Twitter feed as a sort of a way to get visibility for their own work. Um, I think we need to move to a move to more of an on-chain reputation system where as people start voting or contributing on chain to certain protocols, that actually gives them sort of an on-chain resume to where they'd be placed into different protocols into different DAOs. I think that's sort of like key piece missing in the DAO ecosystem to start building these DAOs from the ground up. Um, I think we're still thinking in terms of like web two of how these communities are formed um, and our, our, our need to sort of figure out, okay, well, if we have these, if we're trying to form these uh, DAOs from the ground up, instead of th thinking about, okay, let's spin up an entity and let's raise venture capital, we, we have this problem of, okay, how do we actually attract the right contributors in, in a grassroots manner um, to get the right talent in the door to start building uh, this protocol. Um, I think we've seen, you know, a lot of the early grassroots protocols like Yearn and Sushi do really well because they were from, they, they were pretty grassroots and attracted the right talent. And now new grassroots protocols that are launching are having a really tough time attracting uh, the top talent, right? And they're kind of have to result to sort of traditional uh, venture capital models and can't get sort of this, can't can get the right talent or to start being sustainable. So I think that's the one of the key pieces missing to kind of like move this forward. Got it. Yeah. So is it is, is a good summary of that sort of compensating behavior, at least in the context of DAOs today, is uh, reliance on Web2 tools and infrastructure in, in some cases like talent yeah, acquisition. Exactly. Yeah, right. We're, we're, yeah. we're kind of reliant on you know Twitter, Discord, and whatnot to basically find and allocate uh, talent. Yeah. That well, that, sense. that's the other issue, right? Like compensation. How do you measure contributions in a subjective versus objective way, right? And like, how do you actually determine who gets what and who receives what based on only on-chain activity too, when at the end of the day with most other jobs in the world and in most other contracts, a lot of it is subjective. You know, you need that flexibility to be able to like for managers to make determinations about contribution. How do you do that, you know, in a completely pseudonymous Web3 distributed world where you're only measuring on-chain reputation maybe, right? Um, there's, there's also like an interesting balance to draw there. Yeah, how much do you, uh, and, and anyone can take this or, or Julia, if you had a, a point to make, you can go ahead. Well, I was gonna say like, I feel like all of this sort of falls in like, we generally, I think, need to just create better infrastructure and like create the right rails for collaboration. Like it kind of goes back to the original question of like, how do we refocus contributors' attention? Um, and like so much of it is contextualizing. And like Brian made a great joke on Twitter of like, Linda shows up in the Discord and like wants to participate and wants to help. She like asked the Discord, like, how can I help? And like, you know, someone directs her like, oh, go check out like the task channel. And then three weeks later, Linda's like, how can I help? And it's this repetitive cycle of like, we just don't have the right, um, you know, like again, rails for collaboration. And that ties into compensation. Like Kevin just said, that ties into talent acquisition. Like if there's amazing talent that's funneling in and you're not directing them correctly, like there's no way to actually capture that value and like, how they can contribute to these ecosystems. Um, so I think in general, it's just like making sure that we we are putting in like the right infrastructure for these ecosystems to succeed and be really intentional about it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's well taken. Um, well, cool. In the remaining uh, minute or so here, I would love to go around the horn and you know, um, uh, at, at to your best. Uh, 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 prognosticate about the future and, and what you'd like to see maybe in the next year or so in, in terms of things that need to exist or be built or or evolve within the DAO ecosystem in order for this to, to continue to progress and for these organizations to become more efficient, more productive, and, and actually continue to rival that of, of sort of their traditional real world analogs. Yeah, I can I can get it going. I mean, from my perspective, obviously, just like data standards and indexing proper information across these places, but not to pitch boardroom um, as well. I think uh, one other really important thing is going to be infrastructure to be able to delegate responsibility within these like huge DAO structures. So, which is why I'm, you know super bullish on Orca as well. Um, I think that that pod structure, that delegative model, where you have um, you know, a split of responsibility within these massive ecosystems is going to be crucial for anyone to do anything. You can't expect every member of every DAO to make every minuscule managerial style decision, right? So you, we need infrastructure to be able to delegate responsibility. And I think, you know, tools like working essentially will make it way easier over the next six months. I can, I can go next. I, I, uh, 
I would, I would sort of, you know, double click on what Kevin said, which is like the word accountability. Um, you know, it exists as a concept, obviously, in DAOs. But, you know, if we think about how we try to enforce accountability in, in the real world, right, the, the meat space world, you know, we'll have performance reviews, right? We'll track and, and index a bunch of different contributors and measure their value, right? These sort of very basic things, um, you know, I think um, we need them, right? And, and I'd be really excited for folks to, you know, build tooling to, you know, create some sort of accountability and enforce it. And when you have accountability, you basically have a lot of people working really hard on, you know, a focused thing and that compounds over time. It's a very powerful concept, I think. So any sort of tooling, I think Orca is doing really good work here, Boardroom certainly, um, Rabbit Hole, but there's gonna be more and I'm really excited about it. I definitely agree with everything said and I think pointing to everyone <laughs> sitting in this panel is like, I think just better um, like on-chain identity and reputation that we can point to as uh, you know requirements for uh, participation and ensuring that like we're bringing like this accountability 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 layer into um, these working groups and a really key part of that is just being able to like point to different um, you know uh, requirements on chain and obviously like rabbit holes working on this tremendously. So I'm excited for um, that to grow in the next year. Yeah, um, maybe to, like, to take like a different perspective on this. Um, I, I'm most excited for like new types of DAOs to emerge. I think that, you know, the types of DAOs that exist so far are primarily DeFi related, but I think as blockchains start to scale and layer two blue start to take off, we'll start to see new types of DAOs emerge, especially on like the consumer side. Um, you're kind of like already starting to see this with social tokens, but I think both things like fractional tokens are going to become a huge um, DAO growing point as well, where they have an exact uh, way of voting on the reserve price and on fractional protocol. Um, so that, that should be exciting to watch. And I think we'll see a whole bunch of forks uh, kind of play out from, from these different grassroots communities, um, really just trying to have a, a brand or kind of a flag to rally around with sort of these, these NFT fractional tokens. Um, so that should be pretty exciting to launch in its own. Yeah, I, I think that that's the, the beauty of, of having the substrate for coordination of individuals and, and capital is, is that it's, uh, it creates a, a vast uh, sort of white space for experimentation. And, and I agree, like, I, I think that what we saw sort of in 2020 and 2021 in, in the context of uh, DeFi protocols, um, forking, remixing, and finding different structures for uh, uh, various financial primitives, we'll probably see the same in, in the context of DAOs and, and how incentive structures can align with organizational behavior, culture, and, and ultimately productive outcomes. So um, I think that's a great place to, uh, to end it. So uh, really appreciate, again, everyone joining and um, uh, thanks for, for the work that you're doing and, and also for sharing your perspective this afternoon. So um, thank you. Thanks, Kai. All right, thanks for having us. It's fun. Yeah. Great. Um, so next, we're going to move on to cover uh, DAO legal structures uh, and, and how they exist, quote, in the real world, which we've touched on in, in some form or fashion um, through, throughout these panels. Um, and so today, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to have uh, Joy uh, join us from Syndicate DAO, uh, which is enabling fast, compliant creation of um, things like investment DAOs. Um, Priyanka from Open Law, uh, uh, which, which has been uh, rebranded to Tribute DAO. Um, which is a protocol slash DAO that is focusing on providing structures for DAO creation and, and providing templates for compliant creation as well. And then finally, Ruben um, from IDEO Ventures, who is a, uh, a lawyer by training, but a, a DAO member and, and investor uh, across the ecosystem as well. So thank you all for, for taking the time to join and um, uh, uh, speak today. So um, maybe to, to kick things off, um, uh, it would be great to kind of get a, a, an overview from, from one of you around where in sort of the real world today do DAOs have agency? And I'm sure it'll be somewhat of a, a short answer insofar as, um, you know, there's uh, two proposals that I know of um, in the U.S. with um, uh, uh, Wyoming kind of coming full circle as the first place where the LLC was created and now being the first to recognize DAOs as having some legal standing. I know that there's a similar uh, 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 proposal in place for uh, Australia, but 
and it'd be great to get an understanding of sort of where in the real world do, do DAOs have agency as entities that can be recognized and actually conduct business. Uh, I'd be happy to kind of kick us off with that. Um, thanks, first of all, for having us here. I really appreciate it. Um, but for uh, the question of where DAOs have agency in the real world, I think it's important to take a step back and realize that DAOs, yes, exist on protocols, but they're also just groups of individuals kind of at the fundamental level. And groups of individuals have existed within our legal system for hundreds of years. And historically, we've called them unincorporated partnerships or sometimes just partnerships. So to some extent, there is a, a world in which DAOs kind of always have agency, but they might not necessarily have things like liability protection for their members, and they might not have great risk management. But uh, that avenue is kind of always there as DAOs can kind of continue to define how they want to interact with each other and what kinds of rules they'd like to be governed by. Then on the flip side, we have the proposals that you mentioned, which are really exciting because we get to see a little bit of some clarity and some specificity around entity types for DAOs. Uh, unfortunately, I think um, they're a great start, but it's also very early to even understand where those specific structures have agency. So um, the short answer, I guess, to your question is it depends, unfortunately. Uh, there is kind of a, a whole spectrum between kind of the unincorporated partnership to DAOs attaching to normal legal entities that we've seen before to even novel legal entities like the Wyoming DAO LLC. Yep, that, that all makes sense. And thanks for, for that quick primer. Um, so I guess when it comes to a DAO, there's, we've talked about different structures that exist today. We've talked about investment DAOs. We've talked about uh, cooperatives of uh, artists that are producing works that, that you know they just want to be a, a joint social membership all the way through to uh, companies uh, or, or protocols that act like companies and are producing real revenues have members and quote shareholders, maybe not use that term, but, uh, uh, but members that, that uh, can help to uh, uh, participate and, and govern the outcome uh, of, of how these protocols progress. So uh, I guess the simple question here is, is when does a DAO need a legal entity and, and uh, where in its progression is it day one or day you know 365 that they actually need to start to think about it, if at all? Yeah, that's, um, we can think about that in the context of the previous question as well, Clay, and hey everyone, I enjoy, pretty nice to be chatting with you all. Um, the, the, it, the question depends again on what the DAO wants to do. So as, as Joey mentioned, there's a bunch of stuff that DAOs can do without any legal entity, uh, especially all the stuff that we see on chain. Um, and a lot of the times that depends on the, the members of the DAO um, and you know how they want to be paid for their contributions, how they want to be recognized, um, whether they're happy to take, take tokens or stable coins um, or whether they need you know to be employed uh, by a real world entity. And then similarly, does the DAO want to own you know traditional assets that need a, a legal entity? That's usually been the jumping off point for most DAOs, uh, whether they want to invest in uh, other corporations, in in stocks, assets, real property. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we, we saw um, some, a great example from, from FWB, uh, the, the physical token gated events that they've been holding. Um, and that's a way of a DAO interacting in the real world. You know, when, when the DAO can, um, can decide, you know, who's collectively who's entering this club. Uh, so, so there's plenty of examples that you don't need a legal entity to do. And I think that's only going to become more and more prevalent as we see more forms of um, value being recognized on chain, programmable cash flows, um, where you don't really need that legal entity or that legal structure to reinforce where the value is flowing. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I think I would pretty much agree with that. I, I, I actually, I do agree with that. I think it really just first boils down to what the objectives are the, of the DAO are. Are you, um, you know, a for-profit entity? Then at, at that point, you kind of enter a set of regulations where all of the members, you know, are going to likely receive or joining with the intention of some sort of profit, which requires them to be accredited and you need to go through all of that. And of course you want to be like a limited liability company to like protect against any um, potential personal liabilities there. So like just kind of even dialing it back, I don't know if many of you guys saw or paid attention to the original DAO in 2016. Um, there's like a really nice SEC report, I mean, not nice, but uh, an SEC report on um, the original DAO and whether the tokens there were securities, but it also talks about the structuring there. It, it was 
uh, by default a partnership, uh, which means that the uh, individuals there could be you know, joint and severally liable. So, you know, in order to protect against that like personal liability, you want to have some sort of limited liability structure uh, in place, especially because the objectives of the original DAO was to pull capital to get together to like make investments in different projects in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, again, like kind of what Ruben was saying, like if you have um, something that maybe is like a public good, like we did that with Museo, um, you know, we, we took on a different structure there since it's more of a donation based DAO. Uh, FWB, uh, that's what I meant to say, actually, the one that Ruben referenced, it's more of a community social token. Should they decide to change their objectives as a DAO, maybe they'll reconsider the structure, but they're, from what I understand, no legal entity in place uh, there right now, because it's just like a community for permission and access to a discord and a larger community. So again, it's a really long winded way of saying it depends. Um, and it depends on the community. And maybe I think if you through governance as a community could decide to make those transitions. Um, I get like approached a ton about like, and so I'm sure everyone else here does is like, you know, how do I set this DAO up? And, and a lot of people aren't really intent on like the structure. I would say like back end to the legal things, like figure out your community, let it gel um, and organically. And then from there, really start thinking about what, you, what the mandate is and then think about the legal structuring. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and uh, I, I don't have a JD, but I'm, I'm engaged to someone that has one. The thing that always comes back in, in the conversations around liability and, and, and things like securities law is facts and circumstances. And so uh, with the, the decision with the SEC that you alluded to is, um, uh, is that there is precedent there and, and so, at least some, some guidance, although it's, it's a bit unfortunate that um, for, for DAOs, the, the first sort of reference point for uh, that the entity is is one that required an SEC decision, almost you know killed Ethereum in in, in its cradle. Uh, so um, it's yeah, it's a, it's a good point though that that there is a historical reference. Yeah, I would check it out if you're interested in DAOs. It's it's a report like a memo worth reading. Um, it's, it's pretty well done. Yeah, it there there are a bunch of different aspects to limited liability though, and I think I have a slightly different view about. The, the idea that limited liability is always necessary. Um, there are obviously trade-offs and it's obviously a benefit to have. Um, but, you know, traditionally the idea that the people's liability who are in the company is limit, limited to the capital they put in the, into the company was important when you were like chartering a vessel to explore the South Seas or like running a water park or some activity that's inherently dangerous and risky and, and requires like, it either requires a lot of capital or also um, has, has a lot of like liability risk. If you're running a small online community um, where you, you know, collect and share content and uh, maybe collect JPEGs together or whatever, the actual risk of those activities is much different to some of the other traditional, um, you know, corporation activities. So you might need to think about, you might want to think about whether it actually makes sense in that context. Having said that, like as Pri said, raising money is always a risk, especially in this gray area where we don't know exactly how the securities laws are going to apply. But I would say if you're not trying to raise a huge amount of money, you're just trying to do stuff together with a community on the internet, a corporation of any sort might not, might not be the ideal structure. A DAO might be fine. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a great point. And, and kind of continuing on this theme of liability, um, one of the core roles that we've been talking about today within DAOs are core contributors who are actually writing the code that upgrades or facilitates or, or defines the movement of uh, funds or, or some functionality associated with it. And especially for things like uh, protocol DAOs that are overseeing, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in uh, treasury uh, uh, that, they're, that they're overseeing or value that's flowing through them. How, how does liability come into play in the context of developers? Um, if I'm, you know, say a developer that's, that's writing a piece of code that is contributed to a DAO, can I individually be held liable for any adverse outcomes there? Or, or what does that look like in, in, in the context of, um, you know, maybe the U.S. jurisdictions are, are just more broadly, if, if we can define it in the abstract? I'm like not an expert on this, but I do remember, so I feel like there are other people who could speak definitely more fluently on this, but I do remember like the CFTC, was it like a year or two ago? Maybe someone here can, can uh, 
remember here, but they did say something about how like smart contract developers could be held liable there. I, I haven't actually followed up with that or kept any sort of pulse on exactly where that landed, but I remember that being a possibility. I don't know. If, if yeah. I think that was Brian Quinten's uh, CFTC commissioner in, in one of his speeches. And I think he kind of backed away from it afterwards, but yeah, like you said, Pre, he kind of alluded to the idea that uh, software developers could be liable for the code that they commit or publish or contracts they deploy. Um, but I, I think that's like a, a horrible position to be in. And like we as an industry have to fight against that being the default. Um, I think the challenge here is then who would be liable for like, you know, losses um, due to negligence or fraud um, that, you know, the users might might incur. And I think I think that's a, the big open question, right? Is that collectively the entire DAO membership, any token holders? Is it um, the core team, however you define that? Um, is it the, the people, person who made the proposal? Um, you know, that that's all kind of up in the air. But I think like if there is a position where the person who's actually written the code is liable, then we're all in a lot of trouble. We, we have to kind of, we have to fight against that. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. Um, I think in this case, in, in cases like this, where there is no entity, uh, it comes down to who's a member of this partnership and somebody who has created the code probably is also a member of the DAO. So they would not probably be exposed regardless of whether or not they had contributed financially to it, uh, given that they had already contributed some sort of consideration or some taken some sort of action to participate within the DAO meaningfully. Uh, that's not an ideal scenario, but we unfortunately don't have clarity. So I would kind of echo Ruben and Priyanka on that and saying that uh, that's kind of on us in the crypto industry to really uh, advocate for like greater clarity and for greater, hopefully protection for, for DAO members if possible. Yeah, and, and on that point, what do you what do you guys think is sort of the likelihood that that this takes the form of uh, you know we try to educate the the relevant sort of governing bodies and and oversight uh, or regulators versus like this is just going to need to be played out in the context of case law and you know the slow gears of of, um, of uh, legal clarity will have to be borne out through through things like that where precedent facts and circumstances ultimately define sort of how this ecosystem progresses. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty good question. I feel uh, that's almost a more political one to me. Like it's it's more of like how loud does it get? How much capital gets thrown around amongst DAOs? How many members actually end up? If, if there is like a consumer protection uh, or, or consumers end up do getting hurt, um, they'll probably need to step in. So then it becomes more of like an admin agency situation. And so it gets sorted that way, which, you know, that requires us as like the crypto community weighing in. Um, I guess if it's like a solar burn, uh, there's also like geopolitical issues too. Like, let's say there's like some better friendlier jurisdictions where we can kind of create these like member managed DAOs, like the, the, the arbitrage of like regions competing to get that kind of capital and influence, I feel like will play into to how DC and others move there. Um, but I guess so far, I, I think it's been pretty slow. So like, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up just being like a case law slog. Um, it's kind of tough to answer that, but I, I do think that like the speed of which things are moving, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes like more of a DC thing. And the states here also, like what we saw in Wyoming, have a lot of power, uh, like on the blue sky securities law stuff, but even like the legal structuring side. So um, maybe it starts like, and that's the beauty of guess, federalism in, in the US, but maybe it starts like in some of these more friendly jurisdictions and then, you know, DC pays attention and adopts that or, or whatever. Um, but I guess that's not the best answer. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's, it, I mean, in, it, with things this early, it depends. It's, it's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a bad thing, though, that, that it's evolved this way, because a, a lot of the folks that are kind of, well, crying out for regulatory clarity are the people that have complained about, you know, the gray area for all these years. They're not the folks that are building. The people that are building are the ones who are going to find a way through and kind of assess the various risks and, you know, try to understand, make the most sense out of the gray area, because that's where the opportunity is. Wh who it does prevent is these larger institutional players who, you know, for example, need to know which counterparty they're dealing with and to KYC everyone in, in the liquidity pool or whatever. But we've actually had time to build the stuff that matters because of that gray area. Um, and, we, and we're actually going to have a more robust you know, ecosystem when the time comes that those larger players come in. Whereas, you know, 
tra more traditional fintech where the boundaries and guardrails are so obvious, it's, it is a more, more level playing field, but not as much innovation happens. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Go ahead, Joy. Oh, thanks. Um, I was just going to build on what Ruben said, uh, that there are effectively kind of multiple ways of educating uh, both, you know, politicians and also the broader community about this. And one such way actually is innovation and by building uh, within these gray spaces. So I think, I mean, it all kind of comes down to preference. And I think there's such a range of risk appetites. And right now, the most innovative people are probably also the most likely to take on risk, at least in the crypto space. And that's going to push the needle forward and expose some of the gray area. And also, I think, uh, create some clarity as, as we go along it. I don't like to see case law be the way for it to uh, get resolved. It takes a long time and uh, it costs people a lot, but uh, it's not entirely bad, I'd say for innovation. And uh, uh, I think it's it's where we are right now and I'm kind of comfortable with that. Yeah, um, to, to switch gears, I'd be remiss if, if, you know, with the backdrop of the infrastructure bill and how DC and, and the US are thinking about taxation of different entities, uh, within the, the crypto ecosystem for, for better or worse. Um, it, you know, it'd be great to kind of get uh, your this uh, panel's thoughts on um, taxation in the context of things like investment DAOs or, or protocol DAOs and, you know, when do they have to be concerned about this and, and what, is, what are some of sort of the best practices that exist today in, in terms of, of um, that interaction with sort of the real world as a touch point? I guess I could weigh there. In, in, I mean, in many ways, I think DAOs weirdly could work quite well in that they could mutualize like the tax burden a little bit. Like you could kind of through this community versus like individual pull more capital and then pay, you know, your tax through a larger community through like the K1 process. Um, so, I mean, I think that could, I actually think that could be an opening for DAOs um, in, in some ways. it's one way of thinking about how DAOs could actually be enhanced through that process. Yeah, I would say that it's it's the number one issue for, for DAOs right now. Tax is probably even more so than a lot of the legal issues. It's it's a practical issue for any DAO that uh, is, you know, collectively earning any revenue um, that's realizing any gains on, on flipping NFTs or, or whatever it's doing. Um, there's just zero certainty about what the tax treatment should be and at the worst case partnership for tax law meaning that it's got to actually issue all these k1s and all every single token holder should um treat their share of income coming into the protocol treasury as their income um i, I think that's far from settled and like pre i'm hopeful that we see a world where like there is some you know really clever reporting regime for the DAO itself um maybe the DAO itself is treated as an entity and pays tax um, maybe it's it's all done programmatically, uh, but I think in the, in the meantime, it's a, it's a real stumbling block for a lot of people trying to get into and build DAOs that the, the tax issues um, potentially global, depending on all the members of the DAO and a lot of gray area there too. Yeah, that, I think that, that makes sense. Oh, sorry, Joy, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Um, no, I, I mean, I'd agree with that. This is... Uh you know, significant friction for people creating DAOs and working in DAOs. Um, and it's really, really important to start creating the contingency plans now. We still don't know exactly how this is going to play out and, you know, whether there will be kind of that clean uh, reporting angle that I think we're all hoping for and one that will facilitate innovation. But uh, for anyone in this space, it's, it's time, I think, to start thinking about how will you structure uh, in the next couple of years as things evolve. Uh, that makes sense. And um, I'm going to stay on theme here and, and round out this panel with um, sort of thinking about the future. And 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 I think that to frame the question um, for, for everyone here, it'd be great to get thoughts on, and I think Ruben, you kind of showed your hand on, on one part of it, but with, with regard to the legal landscape for DAOs um, over the next, you know, 12 to 18 to 24 months, what's most urgently needed in terms of the evolution of the legal landscape, whether it's um, operating principles for how you know DAOs should should think about their approach versus you know clarity within um, the jurisdictions within within which they they operate. Uh, 
Um, I, I mean, this is not just uh, applicable to DAOs, but I think just, and this is, again, I know everyone in crypto beats this drum, but I think having just some clarity on securities as it relates to tokens would just be really great uh, beyond, you know, Howie and, and what other information has been provided. Yeah, definitely. I think that's what a pretty clear need. But in general, I wouldn't actually advocate for too too much change, and I wouldn't expect too much in the in the broader field of DAOs and recognition as a legal entity and all the tax stuff. Um, I think it's again one of those areas where the innovation is kind of driven by people willing to take a little bit of risk, um, willing to kind of look at a holistic view about what the what this group of people is going to do. Um, kind of draw draw boundaries about things that are higher risk. Um, and I always tell people like a public sale, public fundraising is probably the highest risk thing you can do. So really, really think about that. Um, but yeah, if you're just, you know, just people, communities coming together to do stuff online are going to find ways to do it in a way that is, you know, fairly low risk from a legal and tax perspective. And out of that, some, you know, best practices and standards are already emerging. And then hopefully we see we see like more considered regulation of, of DAOs as a concept rather than some of the more rushed stuff that's been recently proposed. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, both that there's value in having the gray area because that allows for some innovation. And there's also value in kind of not moving too quickly to establish regulation because uh, it's important to see how the ecosystem plays out and to really make thoughtful decisions as, as a country, as a community on how we would like to be governed. Um, that said, I would still also like to see, like Priyanka and Ruben both said, um, some evolution of best practices, because right now, uh, I think the field of DAOs is really um, a little bit limited to people who are willing to take on this extra risk and are willing to kind of experiment a little bit. And I'd love to see them be able to become even more mainstream, uh, which is something that we're working on at Syndicate right now, is really trying to allow anyone uh, to navigate this regulatory landscape and be able to participate in DAOs and to be able to uh, invest without uh, being kind of terrified about what's going to happen next. Yeah, I think that's a, a good place to leave it, which is uh, is around sort of um, people's appetite for risk and and how accessibility and structure can help to you know lessen that that burden on people to develop um, and, and experiment within the ecosystem. So, uh, thank you all for for the thoughts and 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 for taking the time this afternoon to to come join. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to to uh, continuing the conversation as as we move forward here. But thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so to, to round out today, um, and, and thanks uh, everyone for, for sticking um, through these, these two hours on a Friday afternoon, um, uh, I'm excited to round it out with talking about DAOs and, and the future of venture. Um, as investment DAOs next to sort of protocol DAOs uh, have become one of the most uh, active sort of uh, uh, subgroups of DAOs in, in the ecosystem. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's one worth, worth discussing. And um, I, I'm excited to be joined today by um, folks who are, are operating at the forefront of, of investment DAOs and, 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 and venture. And so um, on the panel today, we've got uh, Aaron um, from uh, Open Law Now Tribute DAO, um, and also who helped to form um, things like the Flamingo DAO, which has been investing in the NFT ecosystem, as well as the Lao, which is one of the first uh, instantiations of an on-chain um, uh, venture capital fund. Um, we've got Ian uh, Lee, who is um, a managing partner at uh, IDEO Venture, Colab Ventures, as well as a co-founder of Syndicate DAO. Um, and finally, Will, uh, who is also from Syndicate DAO, but I think brings um, a, a great perspective from sort of the engineering standpoint of, of uh, uh, venture DAOs and, and their operation within the ecosystem. So thank you all for, for taking the time to join. And um, I think to kick things off, uh, I, I like to think about this on sort of two sides of, 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 of the same equation, but um, sort of traditional ventures participation in DAOs themselves and then uh, investing DAOs function as it relates to venture. So, um, you know, any of you can take this, but it'd be great to start with sort of the current state of traditional ventures participation in DAOs and, and, and fundraising around them. Uh, and, and what are some of the models that, that have been applied um, in, in the context of forming capital there? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll kick this off and thanks so much Clay for pulling this together. Uh, got to tune in a bit before and it seems like it's a great program and thanks for everybody that's participating. So I'm, I'm Aaron, uh, co-founder of 
Tribute Labs, uh, formerly known as Open Law. Um, we pulled together over the past year, I'd say, uh, three kind of large scale investment DAOs. That's the Lao Flamingo and Neptune. Um, and we are seeing, you know, folks in uh, venture or adjacent to venture participating. Um, and I, I think it's it's fascinating. I, I think to your kind of teeing up the panel itself, I think what's really interesting about DAOs is that I think we'll see over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years as the numbers roll in, that DAOs will produce as good, if not a superior return uh, to a more traditional GPLP model. They'll feel more authentic. Um, and I think that they'll prove to be superior vehicles to, you know, pull together capital and deploy it. Uh, I also think with the right structuring, there's questions around it and it kind of dovetails back into the previous uh, panel uh, that if we can structure these things right, we can actually imagine these DAOs becoming uh, represented by tokens or interest in these DAOs represented by tokens, uh, solving some of the vexing problems that I'm sure many folks that have been in VC for quite some time and seen their paper gains uh, stack up, uh, possibly creating uh, a solution around that too. And I think at the end of the day, what you have is, is a seismic shift, right? You're seeing like a new vehicle uh, that's emerging, a new structure that's emerging, uh, that solves a lot of problems, uh, again, feels more authentic and, and really points towards, um, point, points towards the future of where the internet's going. And I think we feel that in lots of different ways outside of DAOs, whether that's Wall Street bets or, or some of the other swarms that we see uh, roaming around uh, the internet. Yeah, makes sense. I'm happy to uh, jump in, and um, uh, that that was that was beautiful. I, you know, we we've been big admirers of of Aaron's work and Priya's work, and you know, all these these DAOs that um, have really been like pioneering the way uh, in in this field for uh, many many years, actually. So, I, I guess what I, what I would bring um, to this this question is, you know, I've I've been an investor for. Uh, seven years now. Um, I started out actually as a, in, in fintech, um, not even crypto specifically, and you know have been in crypto for for about that same amount of time. And um, I've I've come to learn some really um, important things about investing um, because I, I actually didn't come from the investing world. I had like almost ten years of experience in aerospace uh, with very very different uh, background. What I've come to learn is, is a couple of things. I've, I've come to learn that investing is incredibly powerful. It's, it's way more powerful than um, I realized actually before entering into the industry in that it, it, sh it literally shapes what gets built in the world, um, by whom those things get built, where those things get built. Um, and that is incredi an incredible, in incredible tool and enabler of, of change in our world. Um, what I've also come to realize, though, is that uh, investing, in my opinion, is uh, reinforcing inequality um, globally. Uh, it, it's reinforcing wealth inequality, inequality of access to opportunity. It's also like um, because of today's modern structures or the structures that we've been living in for decades, um, it it funds certain things and it doesn't fund a lot of other things that should get funded in the world. Things that, um, to be honest, don't look like venture bets. Uh, they don't look like venture scale uh, technologies or startups. And I don't think that the world can sustain that um, much longer, especially as it relates to inequality of, of wealth. And so in my opinion, what the world needs is a technology um, or a tool that enables more people to participate and invest in things that they care about around the world. And when I think about what that technology could be, I think it is some kind of technology that is a combination of social and financial technology that, al that better allows human beings and capital to better coordinate across the internet. And so I think that that technology is Dow technology, and that is um, you know going to change the world. It's going to disrupt uh, traditional investing. And it's also, but more importantly, it's going to create a totally new um, model for investing that is going to bring more of the world into that model. Yeah. And, and with that emerging model, and, and thanks, Jody, and I think that's a fantastic way to tee up um, sort of the, the key value uh, proposition around uh, how DAOs can enable that, that equalization of, of access and, and, and better 
uh, allocation of, of, of capital to, to um, needs that don't necessarily look like um, venture opportunities. But um, when it comes to sort of DAOs and the technology and what it enables in the context of investing, what are, what are some of the key pieces that um, you think are uh, where they have an asymmetric edge? Uh, you, you mentioned equality and, and anyone else can jump in here as well too, but uh, aside from equality, what, what is sort of the, the, the key advantage that DAOs have relative to the traditional venture capital model? Yes. Well, did you want to hop in? I don't want to jump over you. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, you go. No, no, you should go. You haven't, you haven't chatted yet. Um, I think that one tremendous advantage um, of DAOs is similar to the way that DeFi reinvented substantial portions of the financial ecosystem in just a few years. DAOs are likewise reinventing substantial parts of the um, like uh, corporate governance ecosystem in just a few years as well, um, where when these corporations become and DAOs become effectively nearly free to set up, nearly instant to scale, um, and uh, incredibly easy to govern, you get something that is completely different than what came before. Um, and I think that uh, people uh, who have been through the gauntlet enough times on setting up companies or uh, setting up venture funds miss the fact that most people, uh, for example, we talk with, have no idea where to start when setting up a venture fund. Um, they understand that it's easy once we've guided them through it, but they would never know how to do so on their own. So the way, like I think DeFi replaced parts of the financial stack, just lowering, like making it incredibly easy to, for example, um, take out a loan or, or uh, become a market maker, things that would normally be extremely difficult time consuming processes. Um, DAOs offer that kind of change for corporate, corporate uh, entity formation and governance. Um, and side note, like Aaron, I think that the Wyoming DAO law is one of those things that has created a uh, step change in what is viewed as possible. Um, now people realize, oh, hey, with Wyoming DAO law, I can just have my DAO be an operating agreement. Like you don't even need lawyers involved at a certain point. Um, uh, you can simply uh, have the DAO uh, govern the way the corporation is run. Um, and things like that, I think, will become increasingly transformative as the regulations catch up. Yeah, I think that was well said, Will. I, I definitely think governance is a big piece. I'm, I'm going to throw out just a couple of their ideas. Uh, one is just, I think they, they are going to prove to better manage information. I feel like we all feel this if you've been around crypto for a while. It's just super hard, even if you're fully plugged in you know, at this 18 to 20 you know, plus hours per day, which feels like it's what it takes to just even stay fully up to speed. Uh, you just can't do it alone anymore. We kind of have to band together this torrent of information that's being thrown at us. It's just hard for small teams to, to marshal. And a lot of uh, traditional funds are small teams. There's obviously some gargantuan ones and they're, uh, then they're usually more generalist and focused across like a, like a broader swath of the tech ecosystem. Um, but here you can really build a hive mind by removing the leader you actually open up the opportunity for more people to hop in. They can uh, combine their thoughts and what they're paying attention to. And using some of those governance tools like what Will described before, you can start to get as good, if not better, um, information and noise to signal ratios. And I think that that's probably the most fascinating things about DAOs, at least uh, to me. Um, and at the same time, you don't need to have people that are full-time on it. Uh, they can do it. Um, you know, as part of what they're experiencing online, um, you know, they can do it even though they may be running a business or, or you know, doing something completely far afield from whatever the, the DAO is focused on. Um, and that's pretty awesome too, because you can get people that are really, really close to the metal, uh, that are really, really deep in a particular category that can begin to, to participate and, and share that information. I think the other thing is they can move fast. Um, so I think there, there's challenges there and that goes back again, I think to Will's point around governance. And I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting evolution of how uh, different approaches work. Uh, but by removing a leader, by removing things like quorum or quorum based voting, which is I think the way a lot of uh, places operate, you, get, you can gain a lot of it while also kind of sifting through this mountain of information that we're, I think we're all struggling with. Yeah, that's that's well said by everyone. Um, I, I think that uh, it'd be great to also help to work to outline sort of the the spectrum of opportunities for investment in it, for for DAOs. I think that you know the traditional venture model of of private capital formation for equity is is one element to it, but I think there is this emerging spectrum of of sort of on chain or crypto native opportunities, and and maybe there's other categories 
Um, anyone can jump in here, but how do you guys think about sort of the, the spectrum of opportunities available or ones that maybe are, are uniquely unlocked with, with respect to um, uh, investment DAOs? Well, I do think we're starting to see kind of, at least in crypto, just more DAOs forming and DAOs as a category, I think are going to be interesting uh, investment opportunities. What I imagine we'll increasingly see the tech's really in place. We started rolling this out in Tribute, which is DAO to DAO signing so that you can have a DAO join another DAO through a vote. It's gonna be, it's not fully there yet, but I think it's coming um, and just cleaner. And anybody that's sifted through like closing documents kind of stinks, right? So imagine if it's just a vote, it goes through a period, you're done. And then the capital moves over to, to another, another structure, right? Another DAO. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a big piece of uh, what may be coming. I would say uh, I would plus one that, um, especially from like a tool and experience perspective. I think also like if you zoom out in terms of what's been happening in, in investing for actually like decades, um, it's really interesting even before crypto and, and DAOs, which is that in, in our opinion, investing has been in this multi-decade um, process of decentralizing. You know, you had like, you know, these, these mega funds, then you had all these like seed funds start to pop up, right? Then you had AngelList and then they created AngelList rolling funds. And it was like further kind of like breaking funds down into more like subatomic components or, or more like bite-sized pieces. And then, you know, you have, you have crypto and now you have Dow tech that are going to fully kind of take that to the extreme, right? To the point where, you know, what, what might feel today like an internet community or, or a club or even just like a group of friends on Telegram or WhatsApp or whatever and saying, hey, um, let's invest together in something that, that we believe in, whatever that thing is. And you know, one click, boom, let's, let's start investing together. That is in, in our view at Syndicate where this is all headed. And, um, and what's interesting about that is once you get to that point, that's not actually the end. Um, there's like a whole new world that opens up when that, uh, when that happens. Um, and, and so that what I, is what I think is really exciting. And, and part of what we think people are missing is that it's, it's, it's not like this is about taking investing and putting it on the blockchain. That's not the, the point of this, actually. The point of this is all the things and the entire market that would unlock as a result of this. So like community-based funding of, of whatever that is, whether it's like art, nonprofit things, um, you know, things that are totally outside of like the traditional venture model, that, enti that entire market is gonna start to open up and it's, it's, it's gonna be massive. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, and I think the, the, the salient point there around um, this isn't just investing on the blockchain, right? It is a, an unlocking and democratization of, of different touch points for, for investment. Um, and crypto is just a vehicle uh, that, that enables it. Um, in, in thinking, you touched on sort of AngelList and, and Aaron, you talked about closing docs. That, uh, it'd be great to talk about sort of the infrastructure that's powering these different things. And obviously it's relevant to the work that that the three of you are doing, but um, it would be great to get sort of a, an overview of, of how um, uh, these things are, are formed, um, what are the sort of key tools within the toolkit to enable them and, and sort of what that progression has looked like over the last few years. So I think one thing to emphasize is that we are um, in such an early stage of DAOs that uh, forming, uh, forming uh, venture funds and corporations with DAOs is actually substantially more difficult than, than the off-chain versions for now. Um, and I think people are underestimating how quickly the usability will improve and how much, um, how, 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 how fast the tooling development in the space is being for, pushed forward by Tribute and Syndicate and, and, uh, and, and other, other developers in the space where, um, uh, I mean, like the standard stack right now, for example, um, like we worked with uh, CityDAO to uh, buy land, where they're working on buying land in Wyoming right now. Um, and that is uh, the, the first thing we did was set them up with the Wyoming Dow Law pioneered by Open Law. And that alone was like something that was impossible before was, hey, how does a Dow buy land in a way that's recognized by a state? Um, that would have required a lot of pretty 
convoluted legal maneuvering around un incorporating unincorp previously unincorporated partnerships um, with a lot of lack of clarity to make it happen. And the Wyoming Dow Law provided that uh, clarity. And then the next thing was um, set them up with a syndicate to, uh, to track uh, ownership of this DAO and to allow the DAO to run um, more similar to an actual investment fund and less like a, like a multi-sig. Um, and then um, we also do hook in um, uh, optionally if they choose to bring their own, like a uh, Gnosis multi-sig to manage the funds. Um, these, all of these tools like are like <laughs> emerged in the past couple of years. Um, and that's what I think people miss is that um, like administering a DAO via Gnosis multi-sig, let's say, for example, or um, like even just recording data on chain, um, like recording ownership stakes on chain via syndicate is still pretty difficult and it's still pretty hard to use. Um, but uh, as soon as governance tooling improves, as soon as, um, uh, as, soon as uh, L2s make these transactions dramatically cheaper and dramatically faster, um, we will be in a position where suddenly this will be a whole lot easier than the traditional methods. Um, and I think that uh, it'll uh, happen slowly then all at once as, uh, as the dominance for DAOs fall. I don't believe they're a magic bullet right now. I don't believe they're better than off-chain entities right now, except for a narrow slice of use cases um, that 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 uh, that everyone here is working on pioneering. I do believe that they will consume a substantial portion of the current use cases as they get more and more usable over the coming years. Yeah, I th I, awesome about the uh, city DAO, Will and Ian. That's super cool to hear that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the state of DAO tooling is it's still pretty pretty rough. I think we saw kind of. Uh, V1 of DAOs was Aragon, DAOstack, they're all amaz amazing projects, and they had to vertically integrate everything from day one, just to even get close to what they were seeing in their minds and what their collective team wanted to do. I think the great thing about the growth of DeFi, NFTs, and all these adjacent uh, blockchain-related projects is that we can now begin to move into a new phase. My sense is, is that we'll see uh, kind of a couple loosely, uh, loosely coupled uh, bits of technology that form a technology stack. Um, and I think that that's going to be pretty powerful and hopefully accelerate things. Um, you know, we just released uh, this tribute DAO framework, which aims to solve many of our members' problems. And hopefully we can solve the problems of others in the ecosystem. It's working very closely with Snapshot um, and the Snapshot team. And we've been working very closely with the Collab, the collab Land uh, team as well. Uh, and we think that that makes a lot of sense. I think at the end of the day, what you get is something that's very developer friendly and looks a little bit more like WordPress. And then hopefully people can build awesome projects and platforms and other things on top of it. We saw that, you know, if you look at content as an analogy with WordPress, right? Tumblr, awesome project built on WordPress off the bat. I think they, they help push forward about, you know, 40 to 60% of all content online. Um, so that, that seems to be kind of the right approach. Right now, everybody is like stuck in web one. They're building from, you know, like from the server metal all the way up, like from the ETH level all the way up. And I don't think that that's the way the, the technology stack will look like. We obviously hope tributes that uh, you can imagine a couple different competing approaches uh, emerging over the, the, the next couple of years, which I think is healthy and great for everybody. Yeah, no, really appreciate the, the perspective on both, uh, both yours and, and Will's front. Um, if we assume th that all of these problems are solved, right? That that the infrastructure and 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 the interfaces and the touch points through which uh, investment DAOs um, can can progress uh, is solved, um, you know, fast forwarding to whenever that point is in the future, how how does that uh, look uh, when contrasted to the traditional venture model and and sort of how do um, how will the traditional venture world sort of need to react? Uh, is this something where it's kind of an island problem and, you know, uh, we can just discount it because it's happening at some unknown point in the future? Or uh, are, the, uh, are these two models inherently uh, capable of existing in parallel? Or is it going to be sort of a situation of adapt or die, um, not to be too hyperbolic? But um, yeah, Ian, maybe uh, if you could uh, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, elaborate on, on that and, and how that progression may look in the future. Yeah, I mean, this is this is why um, you know Will and I started Syndicate, um, and and I was you know have been managing partner at IDEO for the last you know several years. It's 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 very clear to me at least, and and a number of other people that the writing is on the wall here. That like this is not necessarily the next 
disruption, but the next evolution event, the natural evolution of venture. Um, which you know, Will and, and the team at Syndicate, we 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 believe is community-driven investing, and and you know the the reason that we have such high conviction in that is is actually not because um, of like Dow technology per se, it's the fact that that's what the world wants. So when you see these like interactions where founders and startups, right, they're raising from hundreds or dozens of like angels or people from their community, right, like. You know, I can't remember, I think it may have been like superhuman or something that, you know, raised from angels and not VCs and stuff. Those are early signals of where the world is is already going and already living. And so what I would um, posit here is that um, a few things that is already happening. <laughs> so so the, the, the interesting thing is that this is not a, a new user behavior or something that needs to be manufactured. It is already happening. It just doesn't have tools that make that really easily easy. Um, and the second thing is that I think that some investors um, get that uh, and are already operating in that world and are going to be leveraging tools like Syndicate or you know Tribute or you know a number of others to um, start to play in that future and lead in that future. Like today, like we're already working with a bunch of venture firms and angels and other kind of like communities to um, like live in that future right now. Um, and then I think there are a bunch who don't either understand that, um, don't believe in it, um, or think that it's too far away. And, and I think that the, the, the answer there is that in, in certain market segments, that is true. Like it's not coming right now, maybe not even in the next five years. Um, but in other market segments, uh, at least what we're finding is like that's already happening, and it's only going to grow at an exponential rate. And so that's where we're focused. Yeah, well said, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's like a, a ride or die moment. Um, you know, which despite the the drama, I think it's like we've seen this in many different ways, right? It's going to be a new channel for new folks to to get involved. Um, I think expert driven models, whether that's in like traditional media. Um, or really any category that they, they still work, right? Like the New York Times is still a massive force. Um, doesn't mean that user-generated content doesn't work, right? Radio stations are still massive. Doesn't mean that, you know, Joe Rogan can't build an empire, you know, via podcasting. I think it's going to be the same thing. I, I usually think the answer to these questions is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think the big wild card though, and it goes back to this previous panel, if, um, if however, there's an ability for interest to be freely tradable. I do think that that will put, you know, more traditional GP LP funds at a competitive disadvantage. Um, so that's kind of one, one, I guess, wild card to that, that, to that calculus. Where I think we are, though, I mean, we saw this before. It was, it was really LCs. They seeped out from Wyoming, right? And they, they changed the, the world back in the '80s. And I think it, it's going to be the same progression, but that's going to take a long time to kind of build out. Um, you know, I think it'll happen fast, like, you know, underlining what Will and I think Ian were saying, but it, it, it is going to be a process along the way. And I don't think it's binary. Yep. Makes total sense. Um, well, so I guess uh, zooming or coming back a bit to uh, the, the near term and, and thinking still about the future, um, it'd be great to go around the horn and think through or talk about sort of um, what, what does the world look like in the next year or so in, in the context of investment DAOs? What are some trends? Uh, or, or things that you would like to see emerge, whether it be infrastructure or um, uh, new opportunities that are unlocked um, for for investment DAOs, and um, yeah, just getting getting a sense of of where the puck's heading would be would be fantastic from from all of you since you're working and, and living and breathing this stuff every day. So I personally think that in the next six months or so, we're going to hit a trough of disillusionment for DAOs. Um, I mm. think that they've been touted very much as a magic bullet for coordination. At the mm. end of the day, DAOs are. Um, online communities that can coordinate funds and coordinate capital together. Um, and that is not a magic bullet for governance. That is not a magic bullet for organizational design. That is not a magic bullet for product development. Um, and uh, what you don't hear about is all the DAOs that like fizzle out uh, moments after they're formed. Um, so I think that over the next six months, like people will realize how far behind the tooling is and how, how much time we have, how much, how much room we have to catch up. Um, I think that after we get past that front, people will start to see DAOs as good for like a really specific set of things. Um, really good for testing new ideas extremely quickly and extremely cheaply. 
really good for coordinating massive amounts of people with a little less trust than what you traditionally require. Um, really good for coordinating, um, coordinating uh, uh, communications between ecosystems or between, between other DAOs. Um, and I think that like the current hype has kind of like missed the, missed the fact that uh, DAOs are at the end of the day about communities and um, saying, I'm going to start a DAO for X without being thoughtful about how to design the community around that um, is something that, uh, that, that, that needs to be done. Yeah, I think those are great points. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on the tooling side. Um, my sense is that we're going to get pretty quick to a snapshot-like moment uh, with DAOs being able to execute any arbitrary uh, smart contract. So what I mean by that is that the user will not need to have any token. They will not need to have any ether in their wallet in order to interact with the DAO and not just vote, which is awesome, but actually move around assets, have more active management of treasury or any other arbitrary smart contract related transaction. We're laser focused on that and have a pathway to build that. And I think that that's gonna open up longer term, um, more, um, more DAOs that are in social community token related um, areas. And that is where I think a lot of this is going. Uh, like to Will's point below, this is really about community at its core and kind of getting you know great folks together and the tech tooling needs to improve. On the flip side, I do think we're gonna see a lot more capital pool into DAOs. I wouldn't be surprised just in the investment DAO category if a couple of things happen. You know, the right now, I don't know the exact numbers I can talk about the DAOs we put together. There's about $150 million in them just in terms of ether that's been contributed. I think that's gonna ratchet up to you know half a billion to a billion plus over the next you know six to 12 months. Um, and then I think that it's going to be considered a, a pretty broad category. Uh, and then I also think you're going to see some DAOs that have performance profiles that look comparable to, you know, elite, um, more traditional GP LP structures, whether that's on the venture or uh, hedge fund side, um, which I think is just going to be a good story to kind of push things forward. Yeah, I guess my quick response to that is, I think in a year or so, people are going to realize that this is a, a, a social financial technology. And, and so what that means is it's going to create social financial networks um, and, and social capital networks um, that are gonna start to form and do things in really, really interesting ways that um, does not exist in today's world. And, and that's uh, what, what, I, what I agree with Will on the trough, trough of disillusionment. That, that to me is, is part of the core kernel that comes out of it and ends up becoming the, the big thing. Yeah, no, I think that that's a, a great place to end it. And so far as, um, you know, if you look at the history of sort of major through lines and trends in crypto, um, that trough of disillusionment actually is is a net positive for emerging uh, ecosystems, whether it was NFTs uh, uh, in in um, sort of the, the early 2018, 2019 era, and now they're kind of having a, a reasonable moment in, in the sun. And um, you know, obviously there's, there's likely to be other troughs of disillusionment along the way, but at least it instilled the focus around, you know, finding a kernel of, of interest and, and intrigue. Um, similarly with, with uh, DeFi, right? I, I worked at Zero X Labs in 2018, 2019, you look at the adoption of decentralized exchange and other, other underlying financial primitives. It was basically flatlined and now, you know, it's having, having a moment. I think DAOs will likely go through the same, but what comes out of those things is is those um, it one it instills focus from the developer standpoint and the builder standpoint to focus on you know the thing that really matters and what emerges is that that kernel of of uh, uh, truth and 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 uh, intrigue that that ultimately drives uh, that that next wave of adoption. So um, really appreciate the the framing and and the lucid thinking here and and also how we can position sort of the future of what's what's to be expected. So uh, thank you again for 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 the time and um, yeah well. We'll hopefully check back in a year or so and see how things are progressing, whether we are really in that trough. That's great. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Will. Yeah, thanks so much. And yeah, thanks everyone uh, for joining. That that concludes uh, this afternoon. Uh, again, appreciate the time on on a Friday and this less than auspicious Friday the thirteenth. But uh, hopefully, we covered some some interesting topics and um, uh, we recorded this, so we'll, we'll share it out in, in bits and bytes and. Um, uh, yeah, if, if anyone is interested in continuing the conversation, um, please feel free to find me on Twitter or, or contact us at Slow Ventures. And um, yeah, again, thank you and uh, have a good afternoon and weekend.